that's what that's what goes with the comedy routine I have. It goes with that. I'm on to get with you. I want to I want to kick your shit can. I want to kick your shit can. Remember that song by the Beatles? You know, I, I want to hold your hand really was a cool song, like harmonically and stuff. Did you ever think about that, Tom? Did you ever look at the, look oh, at the yeah, structure sure. of it? We are, we are live. We are live. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to East Side Sound on the east side of Pittsfield, Pennsylvania. I am your personal manful handful, your wop at the bop, your guinea with the skinny, your guido in the speedo, last true man, heart and soul, undisputed, undefeated, uncrowned king of Pittsburgh rock and roll. You bring out the rest, all the rest. Put them all together. And I want to get in a ring with them all. I want to kick all their shit cans in one good swift kick. My mother always talked about giving you a good swift kick. I didn't know what a swift kick was, but she she did. Hey, um, my name is Norman Roosevelt. Aloysius, Nicodemus, Amadeus, Valentino, Giovanni, Romeo, Bruno, Raphael, Lucien, Aloigi Nardini. And I am certainly happy to be with each and every one of y'all tonight. I need you tonight. One of them nights, baby. I need more you more than you need me. Joints jumping. Pimps and hoes, but there's something missing to your show. It ain't a party till you get here. When you arrive, everybody get turned up. The joint come alive. You make my blue disappear. It ain't a party till you get here. Lights are low. Bands playing, dress the keel, people swaying, but it ain't a party till you get here. When you arrive, everybody get turned up, the joint come alive, you make my blue disappear. It ain't a party till you get here, it ain't a party till you get here. How you doing? parking lot inside the joint it's too damn hot but it ain't a party till you get here when you arrive everybody get turned up the joint come alive you make my blue disappear it ain't a party till you get here I hope I make myself perfectly clear It ain't a party till you get here It ain't a party till you get here, baby All kind of folks hanging, drinks are pouring, dance floor jumping But you ain't here yet You walk in the door, you walk in the room for other men and women It spells doom and gloom because you come on so strong and you stay on so long you like that kind of talk? You know, I was in, I think I was in the great flatlands of Ohio and somebody says, why do you talk like that? I says, I'll tell you why I talk like that. Because I grew up listening to Porky Chedwick on the radio. I grew up right. I fell from the tree. The fun I fell from the funky tree. We call it talking loud and saying nothing, talking shit. Uh, it ain't what you say, baby. It's how you say it. Oh! These are the rules that we use here in rock and roll land. Hey, uh, we opened the show with a shot of uh, a poem that Rachel Ann Bouvier sent to us here at Eastside Sun. We want to thank her for doing that and uh, acknowledging the Uncrowned King and also, more importantly, for acknowledging my friend Paul Shook in the poem because uh, 
I think we all ain't nobody didn't love Paul Shook. And I know this. When Shook passed on, Moondog had to get together at, uh, at Moondogs. And in the history of Moondogs, which is 30 years of rocking, there has never been a bigger crowd at Moondogs. And uh, in fact, when this went down, <laughs> uh, the parking lot was wall-to-wall -wall people. Not just the club, but the whole parking lot and the street. It was just like a, a mob scene of uh, rock and roll people that understood the simplicity, the simple beauty of a man like Paul Shook. Working class used to work on the docks in New Orleans down there. I bet he had a, on the docks sweating, all chesty, big blue eyes on him. He used to tell me he was Austrian. His heritage was Austrian. And um, I never heard anyone talk about Austria that way before, but he seemed to have a fondness there. And um, hell, he'd never even been there. But I guess that's where he got them blue eyes. How you doing? Man, uh, we're glad to be here today. Tom's glad he's here. Tom's struggling. Tom's struggling. Are we working okay over there? We got sound, but pictures lacking. Oh, okay. We got sound, but we're pictures like Maybe, you know, when you're my age, the fact that the picture's lacking isn't such a bad thing. Ah! Well, that means if we don't have a great picture, I'll wait a little while to talk about the great collector's item I brought here today that reminds me so fondly of my father, Arthur Lincoln Andrew Desio Diamundo Nardini. So we're going to talk a little bit. Okay. Hey, uh, maybe I could say a couple inappropriate things. What do you think? Think that's a good, uh, good idea, Tom? Sure. Say a couple things, a little off-color comments. As long as nobody can see you. Yeah, this way they can't see me, so they can't blame it on me. Um, the one thing I like to say is, you know, sometimes you know, think about, you know, um, when it comes your time to go at the end of a, at the end of a great and wonderful life. And uh, you'll know that I've decided it's time for me to check out when you see me walk out of the club with a girl half my age and twice my size. You'll know I'll be going that night. How you doing? Ho <laughs> ho! That's a full grown man. Hey, uh, like uh, uh, I'm hoping some of our followers here at, uh, on Norman Nardini alone uh, are into fantasy football like myself. I've been in the same uh, fantasy league for about 10 years, maybe even a little bit more. And uh, we're the East Side Goonies is the name of the league. And before I tell you the name of my team, I want to give you a second to kick something around your pretty little head. I want you guys to think of what might be the name of Norman's fantasy team. Would it be the Little Big Moths? Is that possible? Would it be the Good Good Guineas? Could it be the Wops with the Bops? Could it be the Uncrowned Kings? Uh-uh. Ain't none of those names. The name that we use in the East Side Goonie League for my team, which has never won a goddamn thing. I've been in the league 10 years, never won shit. Um, the name of my team is the Pencil Tucky Plowboys. Oh, get over here. Tell me how much you like that shit. Because you know you do. You ain't, you ain't even trying to deny that. You're all about it. Norman's Pencil Tucky Plowboys. You kidding me? Hey, uh, we had our draft this week. My quarterback is Kyler Murray out in Arizona. This kid uh, might have a big year this year. Kenyon Drake, his running back, is also on my squad. I've also got uh, Duke Johnson. You know, I draft NFL players with guys that have the best porno names. And the best porno name in the NFL is what? Duke Johnson. Are you kidding me? Are, he was with the clowns for a few years. I never held that against him. I rooted for him. As a clown. Hey, Cleveland started that shit. I don't care what Miller says. You know, Miller will tell you, Pittsburgh started it. Pittsburgh, you know, with that little whiny Irish voice of his. I got to smack that. He'll be whining about shit and to say Pittsburgh started it. Hey, Miller. Cleveland started it because they were frustrated because everybody wants to be the Steelers. 
They want to, they want to don the gold and black. They want to don, not the brown and orange. Are you? I'll come. Anyway, at the uh, our fantasy draft, a couple funny lines come up. I, I thought I'd uh, bring to the show today. One of the lines is a guy. We, God was drafting wide receivers. Yeah, yeah. Are we on? Yeah. If you can see me. Uh oh. Ouch. So there's, you know what they're saying out there, Tom? They're saying, look at that old grizzled man. He's no good. He's no goddamn good. How about one of the guys, when he was drafting wide receivers, he said, how about Sammy Twatkins? <laughs> Are you... Oh, I, okay. At a fantasy football draft with a couple of... <laughs> in you, it's a lot funnier. I get it. No, you're right. You're right. It's a lot funnier. I probably shouldn't have used it. But let me go... Let me dig a little lower... Because uh, we were thinking about ordering, ordering some food, and a couple of ladies that were hanging and, and doing the board, putting up the names and stuff. Wonderful girls, friends of ours. Somebody mentioned something about going out and grabbing something and putting it on the grill or something. And I didn't hear it real good, and I thought she said, Do you want me to go to Vagina Eagle? And I'm like, What did you just say? She says, well, do you guys want me to go to Giant Eagle? But when she, the first time she said it, it sounded like she said Vagina Eagle. And I was, and she like looked at me like I was a bad person for, for hearing that. Meanwhile, I think she was a bad person for saying it. Another great line that came up at the draft, and we'll, uh, it will become more and more clear why this line is important as the year goes on. But the first line is this. Hey. Don't drink and draft. <laughs> you might end up with Duke Johnson in your backfield. Are you kidding me? <laughs> okay. And another line from a wonderful hunky friend of mine. We were, and you know, at, at Fantasy Draft every year, there's always a couple new guys that you haven't met yet. Everybody's younger than me. Everybody's like 20 years younger than me. I'm the oldest dude there by far. And, uh, and probably, you know, the, maybe the most inappropriate as well. But uh, I said something about how many people are sitting at this table, all guys and the two girls doing the board. I says, how, how many people sitting here are wearing silk underwear? And my hunky buddy says, hey, I'm wearing polyester, the poor man's silk. And you know what? I, I got the big Dago smile on my face. I looked at him. I says... You kick my ass with that one. I'm writing that down for the show. Polyester, the poor man's silk. That's going to be the commercial that they have on TV. They'll get a big hunk of a guy up there with his dawn in his tights. And then he'll go, they'll say, how you feel? And he says, look at me. I'm in polyester, the poor man's silk. You know what? And the poor man is the man. I don't know if you know that. I mean, in our country today, it's, it seems that uh, the poor man is uh, having a harder, harder time getting a hand up. But that does not take away from the fact that the poor man is the man. Because here's what I'm figuring. People don't own shit. Shit owns people. So in other words, the more money you have and the more you need to acquire, the more you need to own, the more you need to have and control, the less control you have. The things that you have are controlling you. But when you live, as they say, used to say that one comedian used to say, in a box, in a van down by the bridge, you know, and you open your closet and there's one teacup, one plate, one spoon, one fork, and live the minimalist life. And don't, and owning things isn't something that, uh, is a value to you, you know, your freedom and, and, and your uh, looseness is is what you own. And you know how much that costs? That shit's priceless. You know what I'm saying, baby? So don't think of the poor man as a man to look down upon or sad for. Think of the poor man as the man. You hear me? Because I'll come right... Hey, guys. I'm really glad to see you. I need these shows... Uh, so desperately, you know, um, I went to the doctor the other day and I, and I said to her, uh, Doc, 
My name's Norman and I'm an addict. I'm an adrenaline addict. And I haven't had a good jolt, good strong jolt of adrenaline since this uh, whole, th since the country shut down. Last time I got on stage. There's a drug that gets released in my body when I'm on stage, when I'm squeezing strings. Firing down, looking at it, folks, smiling at the girls. How you doing? You look good. And all that. There's a drug that gets released. It's called adrenaline. At least that's what they tell me it's called. I don't know shit. But I, I repeat it. But I know the feeling of that drug. And I need some right now. I need a shot right I said. I said, I looked at my doctor. I, I said, Doc, hit me right in the ass. Right here, this ass cake. Jolt it in there. And she said, what are you talking about? And, and, and you know, we, it never happened because she looked at me like I was nuts. And, uh, but I, I said, hit me right in the ass. Give me a big syringe full of adrenaline. I need it, baby. I needs it. Man, we're glad to be here. We're going to talk about some crazy stuff. Speaking about a doctor, did I ever tell you about the time? This is great. I think you guys are going to like this. About 10 years ago or so, my doctor says, uh, you've got to get a colonoscopy. And I had already had one. And I don't, I mean, the colonoscopy, you never even know what happens. But cleaning yourself out the day before is the dreadful part and, you know, all that. But anyway, it ain't, it, it ain't all that bad. But I'm just bitching because I'm a, I'm a wuss. I'm a puss. I'm a nobody. But anyway, they told me I needed this uh, colonoscopy. And they says, you don't even have to go to the hospital. They says, send you out to this place out in the suburbs not far from your home. So I clean myself out and get all dizzy and weak because there's no nothing inside me. And me and the old lady go to this appointment. And uh, and they take me in the back. And she's sitting out there waiting, you know, for it's good. Don't take all that long. And uh, then all, all the first thing I know is I see her like in front of me. My eyes are all foggy and I'm just coming out of the dope. And I looks at her and, and I looked at her and I says, how'd I do? How'd I do? And she looks at me. She says, hey, she said, hey, you got to get up. You better get up right now. I says, I know. I says, I'll do it. I says, I'll get up. But how, how, well, how'd I look? And she says, no, you got to get up. They want us out of here. They want us out of here right now. And she's like, as I'm coming out of the dope, she's telling me to get up, put my clothes on because we got to get out of there. They don't want us in there no more. And I looked at her. I says, what do you mean they don't want us in here? They're throwing us out. And I said, why are they throwing us out? She looked at me. She goes, you bit the nurse. And I said, what? She says, yeah, they, they, were, they gave you the drug and they hit you with the hose. And, and they didn't give you enough dope. And in this outpost, they don't have the ability to give you as much drug as they would give you at the hospital. And you needed more dope to get out enough to be able to take the pipe. And uh, when they hit you, you bit the nurse. And now they want us to leave. I said, they didn't even do the test. They threw us right the hell out of there. And you know what we did right after that? I said, I, says, I want sausage. And I went out and I got about a, ate about a half a pound of sausage. Best sausage ever in my life. Did you ever bite a nurse? I have. Can't say that I have. Tom hasn't. You know, probably, you know what, they threw us out. I, mean, I, guess, I guess if I was a regular person, I would be embarrassed about it instead of bragging about it. <laughs> Uh, speaking of fantasy football and football in general raised in a steel town raised in a football baseball town when I was a kid hockey wasn't a factor here uh, hoops wasn't a factor it was baseball, football ba it was baseball first then football but my dad knew early on he, he uh Helped, I think, him and his generation of the guys that helped elevate the Steelers and take it, the whole NFL, to a new height. But I'd like to uh, strap on here and hit you guys with a little number. Now, this number, you can find it on YouTube. And if you're, and I, but, but I don't know why you would. I don't know why anyone would go looking for it. But it's a. Uh, I wrote it a few years back. Oh, I'm going the wrong way with this. Again, the wrong way. Okay, whatever. Um, 
wrote this, and then I cut it here, and I think, I'm sure, Mark Stutzow played drums on it, who's with the Hawks, great singer as well. Uh, I think I played bass and rhythm guitar on it and sang the backgrounds. Um, Moondog sang the lead, and at the end of it, he also did an amazing high-level um, Myron Cope imitation. I mean, he crushed it. Uh, Dave Dombrowski, the polka king, uh, played Squeeze a Box. And I also believe the lead guitar on it was cut by Mr. Glenn Pavone. I, I'm not sure, but I think it was his last recording session. It was cut like 10 years ago, which uh, maybe now, actually, probably a little over 10 years. Maybe 11, 10 and a half. Uh, so I'd like to play you the song. And I know that on Monday night, this Monday night, your Pittsburgh Steelers will be in East Rutherford. Rutherford. They'll be in East Rutherford, New Jersey, playing the New York football giants. How exciting is that? It sounds like a name for a butler. East Rutherford. Rutherford. It does, yeah, it is. It's a great word. And we, when I was in the Tigers, we used to always stay in East Rutherford at the Holiday Inn there. And uh, and I remember one of the maids, this older, we were pretty young then, and there was a girl, we thought she was old probably, she was like 50 or whatever. And um, she would always come into our rooms in the morning and ask us how crazy things got the night before. And then she goes, I know you were smoking dope in here last night, I can smell it all over here. It was She was just great. But that, she, we'd always go to the same motel there. Hey, um, still her football, man. Grew up on it. It's it's a, it's a way of life. And all I can say is this. Steeler Nation. Folks from all around Worship the hallowed ground Beneath the warriors Black and gold Across continents Legions behold We're rich, we're poor, we're working class We're the Steeler Nation And we're gonna kick Your ass Every city in the USA, deep in the heart of Texas, by the Frisco Bay, all over Florida, and up in the Northeast. But on Sunday afternoons, we all want to be in Pittsburgh, PA, because we're your Steeler Nation. Get in your face without hesitation. We're going to give you guys an education. We're your Pittsburgh Steeler Nation. How do you like it so far? You don't? Well, try, hang with me. We're in Cincinnati. We're in Baltimore. The mistake on the lake. Out where the Cardinals score. All over Carolina. And in that city of soul. Man, we want ourselves six Super Bowls. In Pittsburgh, PA. Because we're your Steeler Nation. Get in your face without hesitation. We're going to give you guys an education. We're your Pittsburgh Steeler Nation. Well, the Chief sure done us right with that football team. And if he was here with us now, he would be so proud of his Steeler family. Man, we're in the city where the eagles fly, where the falcons soar, where we have Packer pride. We're in that cattle town where they make Rocky Mountain beer. But here we go, Steelers, is all we want to hear. In Pittsburgh, PA, we're your Steeler nation. Get in your face without hesitation. We're going to give you guys an education. We're your Pittsburgh Steeler Nation. And the Super Bowl is our destination. Yoy and double yoy. Steel Nation, baby, you kidding me? Come on, man. Lick it up, lick it up, lick it up. I only, I had, uh, like I say, we cut about 10 or 11 years ago, and nothing much really ever happened with it.
But I always had high hopes that uh, the Steelers, the Steelers of one of the radio stations would pick it up. I also have had, have had hopes uh, that my Roberto Clemente song, old number 21, would uh, spurn an interest. And uh, yet that hasn't occurred yet. But you know what? Those two suckers are waiting there in the wings. And one day, when the light shines down upon my Dago face, I'll be all grizzled and snot-eyed. And the light will shine upon me, and they'll call my house, and they'll say, Dookie, I just heard old number 21 on the sports radio station, and they spoke of it in glowing terms, just as the song speaks in glowing terms of what? The great one. Have you ever heard my Yogi Berra song? Something Yogi said. Something yo Something Yogi said is played to the same polka beat that Steeler Nation is. Something Yogi said. Um... That's an, I haven't played that one in years, but it's pretty good. Or have you heard Mazeroski Way? These are all Norman sports-themed numbers. Or have you ever heard Photograph? No, you haven't. I'm sure you haven't because no one ever has. But it's a song I wrote about 10, 15 years ago. My buddy showed me a picture of my Tiger softball team from the 1980s. And we were all there. We were all young beautiful, crazy. And when I saw the picture, the song came. And uh, and the name of the song is Photograph. And it's, it's I think it says, I'm looking at a photograph shot 29 years ago, shot 29 years ago of 10 young men way back when. There wasn't nothing they didn't know. With our softball bats, gloves and hats. And then I forget what it was. Oh, uh, something back in the day. And... Uh, how about these good old friends on a Sunday afternoon softball game? And then each verse, I would talk about one of the got one of the ten starters on the team, and give them a little sentence about it. You know, uh, Warren King was there, Grubby was in it, my boy Shooter was in it, Whitey played, uh, and each each and there was Joey Pico who passed on. A lot of them are gone now, but uh, yeah, it's called a uh, photograph. You know what? I'm gonna dig it up, and I've never really learned to perform it, but. Uh, I like you guys so much. And I think there's a commonality in a lot of us that, uh, a lot of us that love music are also people that are, or love sports. Like my friend Germack up in New York City. He's a sports nut and he's also a music nut. You know what I mean? It's like, and that, that's kind of what I'm like, you know. I'm a sports nut. I come from a sports town. Oh, speaking of Germack, let me read his thing. I got these new glass. I got these new Ernest Borgnine glasses. Remember Ernest Borgnine, character actor from the 40s and 50s. He was great. Hey, download Norman's music. Whole LPs are single tracks, <laughs> singles, swinging single tracks, for under ten dollars for the whole EP because each track is for even under a dollar, and you can get it on Amazon or iTunes, and the CDs we have available, and the songs from. Notorious, Bonafide, Redemption, It's Alive, Breakdown, and Paradini. I mean Paradise. And this old train, baby. You feel me? All the, uh, a lot of the records from over the years. You know, there's a couple other records that I've cut that I never released. How about this? And I got to put this out one day. Strict, if only stricken for the reason that the record's done and has been done for 20 years, maybe. And uh, But the, one of the main reasons I want to put it out because I had a cover done for it. And the cover was done by Tommy Yosh. Wow. Do you feel that? Is there a tear in your eye a little bit? A little bit. Me too. Me and Tommy. I know he was you know, one of the young kids that used to hang out at the decade that was partying when he was 14 and hanging out with old 30-year-old dudes like me. How you know? Oh, Grew up on punk rock and rock and roll and lost him a couple years back. But he did artwork for, and the name of the album is Roaches and Butts. And uh, some of you know my song, Roaches and Butts. And Roaches and Butts is a song about a guy that, uh, he, he's down to nothing. He lost everything. And all he has is his car, a couple bucks worth of gas in it, and a couple roaches and a few cigarettes. And at the end of the song, he puts in his, you know, gets, sits in his car and 
puts the hose in and smokes his last few things and uh, checks out. It's not, one, not the first guy I've killed in a song, if you know what I'm saying. I've knocked off a few good people. But, you know, I've knocked off a few sons of bitches, too, over the years. Some of them sons of bitches deserve what they got. You think I'm kidding about that? I ain't. A tooth for a tooth and a beer for a beer. Yeah, man. But I got to, well, that's one I was going to say. That, that's one album that never came out is the uh, Roaches and Butts album. It's all, the artwork's done and the music's done. The song Roaches and Butts, I think, is the last song on it. There's a, a song on it called How's About We Get It On Tonight. Another song called There's a Storm It Coming. Uh, killer tune. Lamont Samuels squeezes the box on it. Speaking of box squeezers, if you don't want to talk about box squeezers, how about talking about lady pleasers? <laughs> Since we missed it at the beginning, how about... Oh, Tom wants to talk about something fantastic. I saw this. This sits in my... I have my own uh, little room at, at, house, at the house. Not my studio room, but my room where I keep my stuff. And uh, this has always been in there. And this was my dad's. And and I thought I should bring it in because, in my mind, it's a cultural piece. And it speaks of a time in Pittsburgh when the Steelers were sponsored by the Iron City Beer. And when all the guys that had jobs, and they all did, drank Iron City beer. Oh, Red Eye. You know, I mean, it was, and my father was one of those guys. And, uh, you know, you got your Steelers, your beer, your foam. And it's fantastic. I, I think of it as a, a time capsule of, of, a, of a Pittsburgh era that, to me, will live forever. And it makes, I should have brought, I also have a couple cans of old frothing slosh. Thomas, you smoke, you got, I said, did you ever smoke any of that? <laughs> no, but I have drank a couple of beers. The slosh. You can, my old man would get it every year, a case of slosh. And he'd la he laughed every year when it came out like it was the first time he had it. But, uh, yeah, and one of the reasons I wanted to bring it was because today I'm wearing an Iron City short, if you can see there. And just a year or two ago, I think it was... The summer before this summer, we played uh, the Iron City family party at Kennywood. Our buddy Cliff, um, and then and uh, at the time Joe was working at Joe Avi, and uh, but we had a hell of a good time. And we had, we were at the biggest pavilion at uh, the park, and we just got a, and we've got a chance to play a mess of songs I wrote. But we sometimes in those situations, I'd rather play songs I didn't write, and just have fun with it. And uh, it was one of those days, and damn. Iron City beer, man. It's, it's Pittsburgh culture. You know, I don't know if young people get that. But a guy my age, looking back, I, I think, how, how could it be wrong for us to keep alive the culture of this time of Pittsburgh? Because this was, the, signifies the city of champions. I mean, the pirates aren't in this display. But, the, but if you had this display, the pirates were in your heart. Because it was all Pirates and Steelers. City of Champions. You know, Clemente, Stargell. And then even up to Manny Sangui and, you know, those eras. Uh, the, the sports mentality of our town is like those characters are kind of like our heroes. Bill Mazeroski, still alive, still cool. Roy Faye, still alive. I got to see those guys a couple years ago at uh, golf events. And uh, just the most humble and class act cats you would know. It's when it, they're from the era when young people won't know what this means. At the end of the football season, they all went back to their job as a truck driver. Or as a, I think Roy, Roy Face was a carpenter. You know, he did, you know, repaired stuff and built stuff. Very talented guy. Also, to this day, had the greatest record of any pitcher. Did you know that, Tom? The greatest record, winning percentage, in one season was done by Roy Face. And guess what his record was? 18 and 1. 
Sandy Koufax never beat it. Tom Seaver, who just passed on, bless him, New York Matt. Uh, no one ever beat that. How phenomenal is that? Roy Face, still alive, in his 90s. Uh, I got one for you. Oh, I'm going to go this way. I didn't. Yeah, I'm going to go this way. I think y'all might like this. I wrote this back in the, uh, at the end of the 80s. And boy, she was a good one. Still in the Tigers, probably like around 85, 86, actually first come on the scene. I always like to mention, this guitar was given to me by Jay Flores, the uh, road manager for the House Rockers, who was a rock and roll person. There we go. Uh, let's see what we got here. <laughs> How you doing? Shoes, fist that hoes when she walks in a room. Everybody know, got her head done up. She could use a style to make and a man act like a child. That woman is armed and dangerous. To every man she meets, she remains a stranger. You see her late at night She'll kiss you first But then she'll bite you She will bite you She's armed and dangerous She got some lipstick on And them tight blue jeans By the look in her eye You can see she's real mean And I would do anything If she would be my friend I just want to take her to the world's end That woman is armed and dangerous To every man she meets She remains a stranger And if you kiss her She will tell all the girls If you done it well She would tell She's armed and dangerous Nothing can keep you away from her She's the only thought in your head She wear a high heel shoes Fish that hoes when she walks in the room. Everybody knows she got her nails done up, and she could use her style to make and a man act like a child. She's armed and dangerous. Hey, she's armed and dangerous. Now take a look at that girl. She got everything in the world. She got style. She got grace. She got all the right parts in all the right places. She's on that dangerous. Dangerous. Oh! I wish I could have been out in the flow. Showing you how it's done. Cutting it up. Oh! Swinging it to and fro. Yeah, that's a that hunk of music right there. It's nice to play with the old-fashioned piano. Maybe a guitar tuned to a chord. Get that sound, oh, that ringing sound. 
nice straight boom, boom, boom. Maybe a little bit on the bell of the cymbal, you know what I'm saying? Boom, 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 down here on the bass. All simple. You know, when you're playing rock and roll, this is important. When you're playing rock and roll, well and right, nobody on stage should give them to play. In other words, and, and, and that defines to me, and I know I ain't always right or my opinion is just my opinion, but when bands started like trying to play all these complicated things and showing you all this technique and all this stuff, I always thought that was bullshit. I, th I always play simple, make it feel good. Play things, the only things you play are the things you can play in your sleep. And that way you never get uh, scientific and uh, complicated. And as soon as you do that, you know what happens? Ain't no feel. Ain't no feel, my brother. You got to sock it and pop it. You know, nowadays, you know, you don't even know what, what in my day, when a drummer played, that feel of that drummer defined the band to a certain degree. You know, the way Ringo played was, whether you like him or you didn't like him, the way he played was he played for the songs that they wrote and recorded. Charlie, when Charlie plays, he plays the way Charlie plays, and the songs all kind of revolve around the way he plays. So, you know, the band starts there. But nowadays, with engineers coming in and putting everything on the grid and all that bullshit, and never really... A lot of, they cut, and the band ain't ever even there. And, uh, some, you know, and that, that's one of the reasons why music has changed. You know, when you listen to a record that Leon Russell produced, you know... A Jim, like a Stones record, Jimmy Miller, those records, uh, Traffic records, all those records, you could feel the drummers and the way they played, it started down there and worked its way up through the arrangement and the production. And that was, and I think in my parents' generation, like the Glenn Miller sound was the Glenn Miller sound. You know, and his band swung a certain way. Count Basie swung a certain way. Duke Ellington swung a certain way. Tom was just talking about Cab Calloway. I mean, Cab Calloway was so hip, so dramatic that uh, the whole world watched him work and everybody just shut up and watched the man depants their brain just with his moves and with his lyrics. He was just, he knew what he was doing. See, doing this shit ain't just singing, you know, like they put on these shows on TV, you know, The Voice and all that shit. You know, if somebody has a nice voice, okay. But what the hell does that have to do with rock and roll? What does that have to do with entertainment? You know, I mean, what does that have to do with a music person? Just because when you open your mouth, a nice voice comes out, it don't mean shit. What means shit is who are, who you, how are you going to live? How is the music that you live coming out of you? And, and how is that? handed to the people and that's how a man can or a woman can find themselves within the music it ain't all about the voice and, you know I, I, to me it's it just i'm not looking for that i'm looking for the heart i'm looking for the soul the brain the feeling the humanity the voice give me i'll, I'll slap this sh how you doing y'all's out of sight hey and you put up with me, so you must be. I want to send it to John, my friend John. He always talks about my little sippy cup. He makes fun of me like a little baby. I'm going to take a little sip of my baby cup. How you like me now? But hey, how do you guys like uh, the uh, great, iconic Art Deco Iron City? display are you kidding me can we all agree on something in america today can we all agree that that piece of trash is fabulini can we agree on that yeah we can uh last time we got together i made an attempt how feeble it was or not or how entertaining it was or not uh what the hell's the difference, right? But uh, I made a 
an attempt to talk about the, everything that happened in 1980. But I only got halfway through 1980. So what I'd like to do now is uh, finish out the year 1980, telling folks what I was doing in 1980. And then I, what I'd like you guys to do to think back of what you were doing or who you were, I mean, what you were doing in 1980. <laughs> so we got as far as July 15th. I'm going to get my, my stool. We got as far as July 15th. Doll. And uh, so we'll go start from there. <clears throat> On July 15th in 1980, me and the Tigers played the Ritz in New York City, which was by far the coolest club in New... I mean, I, I shouldn't say it was the coolest club in New York City because there was so much action, so many great rooms. Um, but it was the biggest. And it was the last club I was ever in where they had cigarette girls. Are you kidding me? How about being... How continental must a man or woman be to be at a club where they have cigarette girls with a little tray and with a little hat. Are, he, are you kidding me? First time I looked over and saw that, I was like, you know what? I think I, I think I died and went to rock and roll heaven. Cigarette girls in a club? Yeah, baby. So on July 15th, we played New York City at the Ritz and opened for a band from New Zealand called the Drongos, who I ain't never heard from since. And I don't even think I heard from them, them that day. I, I, I yeah. Don't even remember seeing them. On July 17th, we played the Fast Lane. On July 18th that year, we played a club, club called Creation in Orange, New Jersey, and opened for an act called Carolyn Moss. She was good. She was like a, a rock and roll chick back in the 80s, and uh, she had a bit of a, a following and a name out there. And so she did a lot of dates. And um, at the time... Being on a show with her was a good thing because she had all she had she made some bones in the biz. On July 29th, we, we were back in Pittsburgh and we played at Mancini's opening for a lady by the name of Pat Benatar. Uh, I believe she's from Jersey, but her husband's from Cleveland. I ain't mad at him, you know. I got over from Cleveland. Hey, some of my best friends are from Cleveland, I'm a jerk. August 18th, where did we play? Back in New York City at the Ritz. And this time, it doesn't say who we played with, but it said there were uh, 2,000 people in the house. We might have been playing with, with some Rolling Stone movies or something like that, you know what I mean? Um, how cool was that? And then August 22nd, we're in New York City, and we played this really cool club called Tracks. That a lot of folks played. A lot of bands did their showcases at Tracks. And that night at Tracks... I met two people. One of the guys I met was um, a very uh, intelligent and good-hearted person named Steve Mazarski. He was an attorney, and he was uh, managing uh, the band that Cindy Lauper was in called uh, Blue Angel, I believe. He was handling them, and he was doing work with uh, the Whalers. He was working with the Allman Brothers uh, as an attorney and uh, sometimes in manage management capacity. He ended up working with me in both. Um, he's Whenever I did, got with CBS, he's going to put all those deals together. Okay, but I met Mazarski that night, and then I met this other guy. And this this guy's name was Fat Frankie Skinlero. And he was like uh, New York City all the way. And he saw me and watched me work, and he was just come over and was just like right away, dude. You know, like he, he got who I was and what I did. And... Uh, and then he started talking. He says, hey, I work for Shep Gordon. And Shep Gordon managed at the time Diana Ross and Alice Cooper. And Frankie, I mean, <clears throat> what a roster, right? Diana Ross and Alice Cooper. How fantastic is that? Really, right? But Fat, Fat Frankie says, you know, you should think about working with me. I'm, I'm up be able to handle you here in the city. And that's when he said, uh, I want you to meet my cousin. He's an actor. And then he said, uh, he just finished making a movie with De Niro. 
and he blows De Niro off the screen in the movie. You know, and you know, a guy that you just met on the street in New York City tells you his cousin just blew De Niro off the screen in a movie, and it was his first movie he was ever in. You're like, okay, Fat Frankie, sure. Joey Pesci was his cousin. He's, I got to meet him. He's about six inches shorter than me. Um, but a real nice guy. And yeah, and he had that cool voice, you know, but he, he wasn't selling it like he does in the movies. But he was a very nice guy. And also, Fat Frankie was very good friends with guys I had already met hanging in Jersey, which was the uh, Brigatti brothers, which was David Brigatti, who sang uh, background with... Uh, Joey D and the Starlighters, who did Peppermint Twist, and and he and he also did a lot of the backgrounds with the Rascals, and and David's brother was Eddie Bergardi, the uh, high singer in the Rascals. So um, got a chance to hang out with those fine Italian gentlemen. But Fat Frankie Skinlero, right? Hey, it's me, Fat Frank. And he wasn't all that fat. I mean, he was just like, but he was Fat Frankie, you know. As, I guess it was a New York City thing. Okay. August 23rd of 1980, we played the Fast Lane, and Johnny Bon Jovi's band, The Rest, opened the show that night. And they were uh, local Asbury Park area guys. And, uh, you know, do I have to tell you that at the time, they, they were a local band and doing a mess of covers and some original stuff, but they had a lead singer that was awful pretty. Awful goddamn. Yeah, 18, 19 years old. Come on. You kidding me? Face like that. It wasn't like he wasn't picking up fans along the way. Nobody even realized he was tough and smart yet. He At that time, he was just good looking. But he had his thinking cap on. Okay, September 6th, back in Pittsburgh. Mancini's again, opening for a band from um, England called The Pretenders. Which we ended up opening for them again. At her first date, back in her hometown of um, Akron, their first date in Akron was at the Blossom Outdoor uh, Shed. We opened that show uh, with, with the Tigers. And at the time, both the guitar player and bass player who died from junk were alive. And so we got a chance to play with the real pretenders, you know, the band that... Uh, special, special, have some. How about that record? You know what I mean? It, Great record. Special. Love that record. It was just, it was new and it was soul. You know what I mean? And it was like, it was like one of, a lot of guys were, you know, that uh, quirky guy from New York, they were trying to do soul tunes and David uh, Byrne, you know, good and all that stuff. But I don't think he made any records as good as special. Well, I have some of your potential. Hey, did you ever hear the song Potential? Tom, have you ever heard it? Fantastic oh, record. Do. It's by the Jimmy Castor Bunch. Yeah. It's from the 1960s. And it's a rhythm and blues record. And it's a Jimmy Castor Bunch. And, and on the record, the lead singer kind of just talks a lot. And he talks about the word potential. And he asked the guys in the band, what does potential mean to you? And the other guy, one guy would say, it means possibilities. And the other guys would spell it out, P-O-T-T-E-N-T. -T -E and it's just a fantastic record filled with humanity. You know, these records, I hear a lot of these pop records, these guys from England with nice voices and decent songwriting. They make these records where they have the piano play and they want to have a piano on it. And then they make the computer play the piano and it just strikes these chords like uh, so uh, childlike and so unmusically. And then they'll put a, a real nice singing voice on top of it with these like computer played piano things and that has this giant big sound, but, but there's no soul there. There's no feel there. There's no, uh, dare I say the word, humanity again. That's... Uh, what I miss in today's music, the humanity. Who played it? You know, why, and why did that guy get the job? September 9th and 10th, 1980, me and the Tigers drove up 
to from Pittsburgh to Boston. And at that time, that was probably from Pittsburgh to Boston. Probably would have been a ten joint ride. That would have took ten joints to get there at that time with that band. Uh, September 9th and tenth, we opened for Mink Deville, starring Willie Deville, at the Paradise in Boston, Massachusetts. Two nights in a row. And that's the night Willie Nelson said, or uh, Willie Deville said to me, he says. He says, hey, man, Norman Nardini, what's your real name? And I just looked at him and he goes, that's a clown's name. <laughs> that's what he said to me. <laughs> I mean, he was like a New York street, slick, handsome, tall, had one of them real pencil thin mustaches. I wanted to smack him right across the face. No, I, mean, I want to slap him for having that little mustache. But I was a fan of his and he had this real soulful voice. And he had a guy from Erie in his band playing guitar who got to be a buddy of mine. Tom, do you know who Ricky Borsha. Yes, yeah. Ricky. And uh, I got to hang out with him. I, we identified because I was Pittsburgh. He was um, Erie. And we, we had met somewhere along the way. Probably, who was his Erie band? Oh, I, many. Many played with them all? Many different ones. But that was like a, a nice two-night stand uh, with Willie at the Paradise. Uh, both sold out nights. And that wasn't a giant club, but it was probably like 450, 500 people. Uh, and then the September 11th, wow, which is today, which is also September 11th. I haven't mentioned that because uh, I have a hard time mentioning things like that. But on this particular 7th, 11th, September 11, we played The Rat in Kenmore Square, baby, which was a legendary punk rock rock and roll club in Boston. I think Aerosmith and a mess of bands, you know, uh, made their bones in that little shithole. <laughs> September 18th of the same year, 1980, me and the Tigs. Blew down the house at the Ritz in New York City. And after the gig, excuse me, after the gig, we were supposed to get back to Pittsburgh because we had been out for a few days, for maybe probably for 10 days, two weeks. And uh, at the end of the gig, we're in the dressing room, you know, hustling, getting our clothes changed and getting ready to get. A lot of times in New York City, as soon as you're done with something, you want to get the hell out of there. And uh, we wanted to get out of there and get back home. And, um, you know, when you're on the road, when, you, when you're at home, you can't wait to leave. And when you're on the road, you can't wait to go home. That's rock and roll. So anyway, we're, right after the show, we're back in the dressing room. And these long-haired guys come walking into our dressing room, and they're just standing there and, and saying, hey, great show, nice to meet you, hello, hello, hello. And then this, like, official-looking guy, looked like to be their manager of whoever they were at the time. And he said, uh, he says, hi, my name's Tony. And I manage these guys. Foghat. You know, Lonesome Dave. Roger Earl. Uh, I was like, wow. And uh, he said, hey, we really loved your show and we really love your songs. And they says, we, we was willing to ask you something. I says, what's up? He says, we live, we all live out at the end of Long Island in a town called Port Arthur. And later I find, when we went there, I found out why they call it Long Island because that son of a bitch is like two and a half hours long. I swear to God to get the end of it. But they lived all the way at the end of Long Island and there they had a recording studio. And Tony Otita says, we'd like you guys to come home with us. I'm like, what do you mean? He says like, where are you going next? I says, we're going back to Pittsburgh. We've been on the road for a couple of weeks. And he says, look, he says, do me a favor. He says, come home with us. He says, I'll, I'll buy, you, buy your meals. I'll pay for your hotels. And tomorrow and the next day, I want to take you in the studio and record you guys playing live. And what I want to do is have our families and friends have a party while you guys play and while we record you. And I looked at everybody and everybody's like, what the hell? It's like, do we have enough reefer for this? I guess we did because we did it, and uh, and it was a great time. I still have the two inch master tapes from that. But how cool is that? They came and said they wanted to take us home with them because they wanted to record the manful music that they heard. 
And uh, although they never really cut any of your songs, I know they pulled down the pants and give it a sniff. <laughs> Love that. September 29th of, of uh, 1980, we played at the Cleveland Agora with a very cool local band up there called the Wild Giraffes. Let me ask a question out there in internet land. Are there any giraffes that aren't wild? Let me know. October 18th, we played at Fat City with the Automatics that featured Guitar Slim and my friend Mole. I think Joey D was playing drums, Joey D. Simone. And I think Benny Garla Benny was playing bass. It was kind of like uh, somewhere between Rockabilly and Rock and Roll act. Very cool act. And uh, I wish I could have got them to stay together longer and accomplish more. October 22nd, we played with an act called Ellen Shipley. And I don't know where. I just don't see that name. And this is a good one. And this is actually the last date I have for 1980. For some reason, I didn't fill out the rest of the year, which I'm sure was fantastic. Because we never took no breaks. We didn't take time off. I mean, ever. This is the only time I've ever not worked. But anyway, October 3rd, October 23rd, 1980, Tony Otita, the guy that was managing Foghat, brought Albert Grossman, who managed Bob Dylan, Janis Joplin, brought him to Peck's All-Star Stage on the south side to see me and the Tigers blow. Are you effing kidding me? Bob's Dylan manager came to see this. And it's raw, ignorant glory. I mean, nothing ever came of it, but he eyeballed it. He'd give it a sniff. <laughs> Smells like Norman. <laughs> and that's all I have for 1980, but what a year, right? How much fun did we have in 1980? And then that went on for another 10 years, so we're going to be talking about those things as we go along with these Norman Nardini alone shows. Uh, maybe we'll play a number. I have a few. Let's do that. I did this one. No, I'm going to do this. I was going to do one, but I decided to do another. Uh, this one here, I wrote, I guess, about 1989-1990. We like to send it out. To our friend Marsha, who's a Starlight regular and uh, who we all like very much. Because, and she always gets real excited over this number. And this is uh, one that uh, I put on the, or we put on uh, Mark Stutzo's first solo record, uh, Rock My Soul. And then the Nighthawks covered it again uh, a couple albums back. It's a song called Three Times Your Fool. And it's uh, me imitating that era of the 1960s rock and roll where the bands would uh, do these uh, super romantic, semi-soulful numbers, like Then You Can Tell Me Goodbye. I always refer, refer to that number as something that inspired this number here. And uh, those kinds of songs. And uh, it's a thing called Three Times You're Full. I'm going to leave the long introduction out because it's just me playing by myself and We'll get right to the meat. We'll, we'll, you know what we'll do? We'll take the meat and we'll slap it upon the table and it'll be real loud and everybody will look around because the meat will have been slapped. If I'm a fool for loving you been a fool so long and if it's true what they say about love it just keeps on getting stronger the first time you heard me I thought I would die 
the second time I broke down and I cried Third time you heard me I played it cool I guess I'm three times your fool And if I knew That you'd fall in love Baby, I just play along I'd be blue Until you found your way back home The first time you heard me I thought I would die The second time I broke down And I cried Third time you heard me I played it cool I guess I'm three times your fool And oh, I know you feel the same Way down deep inside The magic, yes I do when you're standing, standing by my side. I'm your fool. Well, three times your fool. Hey. Three times you fool, baby. Get over here. Give me some sugar. You know that loosen you up, right? Slow dance or something like that. And then they got the mirror ball. All the teenage dancers that have the mirror ball. And then you see a girl from across the room. You wouldn't even talk to her all night till a slow song come on. And that's when you go over and then you hit her with, would you like to dance? <laughs> oh, you were sneaky, weren't you? When you something. Three times you're full, man. But that's a perfect song for horns. You know, you, you know, that'd be a good song. You know, you could hire a good tromboner for that one. <laughs> and I learned over the years that chicks dig tromboners. Pretty much. I mean, most of the time you can almost count on it. Uh, what are you going to do, man? Hey, um... You're watching Norman Nardini alone, 12. That means we got 24 hours plus of high-level bullcrap. Straight from the east side of Pittsfield, Pennsylvania. Right out the mouth of the beast. Little big mouth. You know, when I was midget wrestling, I was killing it. Me and Big Tiny Little. The Manful Handful and Big Tiny Little. Everywhere we went. Chicks. It was all over us. All over us. I mean, actually, because we were down here and they were up there. I don't know. I'm just making that shit up. But you know what? Wrestling and rock and roll. When In the 80s, when there, there was that fleeting moment when Cindy Lauper and uh, Captain Lou Albino, I mean Albano, I love that era of rock and roll. Rick Derringer. What was that? Uh, Hulk Hogan, he had a song, something about America. I think Rick wrote it. And... Uh, in fact, Warren King and Bird Foster were out with Hulk and uh, when they were doing some of their arena shows with the Hulk, 
Hulk would bring his own band, and Moore and King and Bird Foster were in the band, and they would go to the arenas and, and play before and after the events. Rock and roll and wrestling. I mean, and that, then there was another, right after that, there was the cool era of rock and roll and strippers. One time we played a strip club, and uh, there was all the stripper there, so, and we were playing, and this beautiful little stripper, she got up behind Whitey, and she saw his pile of sticks there by his drums, and she grabbed one of his drumsticks, and she stood up on behind Whitey on stage and started beating herself on the ass with a drumstick. You don't make that shit up, you know what I mean? You see that you're a part of that moment, and you're like, it lives forever in your dirty little mind. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Are you kidding me? Rock and roll, wrestling, strippers. What what, do you, what else you got? We'll take it. Hey, uh, I'm wearing my Iron City beer. Uh, nice guy shirt. I've very rarely in my life worn a shirt like this, but I'll do it only because of the Iron City logo. Mike Flo, Big House Mike, one of my main drummers over the years, wonderful guy. He'd always wear shirts with these little collars, like pink ones. And then when he said, he, I, said, I, said, I said, wow, I said, where'd you pick that color out? He goes, it's salmon. I'm like, dude, you... And he had buys, tries, pecs, lats, all that shit. He was stuffed into it. You could see his big man tits bulging out. You know what I mean? I never had that shit. Where got, you know, guys had beef on their bodies, you know, and it was like part of what they were selling, like the wideness of it, the thickness, the... I never had that shit. I was like a little monk. You know, if if, if you stripped me down naked, it would it's, it's, you'd get the same effect. But if you took a chicken and plucked all its feathers, that's how what I look like when I'm naked. So don't get too excited. Not that you were. Uh, Friday night, the mantle handfuls out the house. I'm going to tell you this story. This is a. Uh, I, a lot of times on the show here, I've told stories about my dad. And this one, I don't believe I've ever told. And it's a great one. When my dad was in the service, he was the head of the mechanics. The head of the mechanics that fixed airplanes. And not just airplanes, but spotter planes. And what spotter planes were, were planes, very small planes that were made by aluminum frames or very light metal. I'm not sure it was aluminum, but very light frames. And they would just take paper, literally paper, and tape it over the frame. And that was the carriage of the plane because the, the plane was made of paper, in other words, and a frame. And it had like these motors, since the motors didn't have to run real hard to pick all that stuff up in the air, they were real quiet. And... Our country used, they called them spotter planes, and they would fly them over enemy lines to see what the hell was going on. And my dad was in charge of keeping them planes running and the mechanics that did it. And he told me this story one time. I think he might have only told me once or twice. But he said they were working so hard and so heavy, you know, in World War II, trying to keep the planes going. He said that he worked himself to the point where he passed out, and they took him to the hospital. And they put him in a hospital bed, and the doctor says to him, you know, you're going to have to stay in here for a week or so before we get your strength back. He says, you, he says you're, you know, you're uh, dehydrated, undernourished, you need rest. And my dad said, and they, they, he talked to the guy, and he laid there for a couple hours, and they started giving him stuff to help make him feel better. And then he said, and later that day, his sergeant, his boss, came to him. And uh, to his room to visit him and said, hey, well, what would the doctor say? And the doc my dad says, the doctor said, I'm going to have to be here in a week. And his, uh, my dad's commander says, hey, Art, uh, we're, we've got orders to pull out of here. And they're going to need us further up the road. And uh, I don't want to leave you here. My dad said, I don't want to stay here. What do you want to do? And he said, his sergeant said, look, tomorrow morning, about 6.30 in the morning, I'm going to pull my truck up right underneath this window here. And you're going to jump out the window, jump on the truck, and we're just going to leave. And we're going to go to the next gig site and get back to work. And my dad said, and that's exactly what happened. He says, he says he rested the rest of that day through the night. It's time, it's time came, and he said he was ready. 
jumped jumped out the window into the truck. They drove away, and he never heard about that problem again. Is that not a man? How proud can I be of my old man? Oh, another quick story I'll tell you about my dad that was great. My dad said when he was like in junior high, you know, guys start getting hair in their balls and starting to see who's honcho and who ain't, who's a man and who's a punk. My dad said there was this one kid at school, my, and my dad was little like me, but he was, but he was unlike me and he was strong because he worked on a farm from the time he was five or six. But he said, so this, this guy kept making fun of him for being a little dago and talk, calling him a little grease ball and punking him down. And uh, my dad said it was just made him madder and madder and madder. And he says, but he knew without an advantage, he couldn't defend himself against this guy. So he said that he, what he did was he waited till the guy didn't expect it. And he hid like on the stairway where he was in, taller than him and higher than him. And he said when the guy came up the steps, he like turned around and jumped on him and grabbed him by the throat and just started choking him and took him to the ground and was choking him. And the guy couldn't even get an angle on him or hold him. And he was choking the life out of him. And the guy was turning pink. And my old man had him right where he wanted him. And then he said he let him go. And he said, and he says, I don't want to kill him. He says, I just want to let him know, don't treat me that way no more. It's, you know, you're going to run into trouble. And that's, he only told me that story one time. But it was cool, you know, because I, his, he had the strong hands. Because he was a mechanic, you know, he was fixed. He, I think he said he built his own car out of spare parts when he was 12 or 13. He was driving when he was 11 or 12. He would drive all the old ladies to the store. And then they would, uh, he'd wait for them outside to carry the groceries in the thing and then take them home, carry the groceries in the house. And they'd give him a couple pennies and for gas and stuff. It's a great time in uh, our country. And a lot of the people in his neighborhood come over on a boat, mostly all Italians. And they, the, the older ones all spoke broken English, and then they were trying to raise their kids to be American. Like my mother. Mom, why'd you name me Norman? I wanted you to be American. I didn't need another Tony, Louis, and Petey's running around. We got all those in the family. So you're going to have to name me Norman? You kidding me? You're making fun of my Norman. Story about my dad, right? The ultimate, ultimate dude. Hey, uh... Try this on. Wednesday night, I got a, I got hit. I uh, been trying to write a song for my mom. She's been, it'll be eight years, coming up a month or so since she's been gone, and I've written a couple songs for her and I've uh, worked them out a little bit. And but I never, you know, like when I wrote the tree for my father, I knew, and that ain't probably gonna be the last song I write for him. But I knew it defined him, and I, I had my song for him. And I never really felt that I had mine for my mother. And I don't know that I have it here. And I have the music written, basically, but I'm not going to play the music yet. Because it just started on Wednesday, and what's today, Friday? So it's not even 48 hours old. But I, I'd like to read you the words <clears throat> of um, this song I wrote for my mom. And... And, and, and uh, it's a picture of my relationship with her, but it's and as I'm reading it to you, it's also a picture in songwriting, and how how it's written and, and, and the approach of it, and, and, and I'll, I'll tell you about that. The, the the first two verses are about me being younger and my relationship with her, and things that happened that made me realize the closeness that we needed to have to one another. In other words, the first verse was about when I was away at music school. The second verse is about later when I was probably in the Diamonds or, uh, or the Tigers when I was on the road and I didn't make it home for Christmas. Uh, and then the last verse is about um, the end. So I'll, I'll read you the words and just uh, see what you think of this. It's brand new and uh, probably the words are going to change because they always do. But, but I, I've been, haven't really slept in two days just working on this piece. Less words, more meaning. When, when you're writing songs, you know, I know a lot of young guys that have brought material to me and they, they write the words and and the words sometimes rhyme and stuff, but, but the meaning and the depth of them, I try to get them to figure out how to uh, 
get that. And uh, so, so this might be a good song to listen to to figure out how that works. So here we go. And the name of the song is Soon. I was away getting educated and we was talking on the phone. And I could hear the hurt, hurt in her voice. She said, boy, when you coming home? Soon we'll be together again. I can hardly wait till then. These lonely days are rough. Feeling blue. Missing you. Because soon, soon ain't soon enough. Didn't make it home for Christmas. I was working on the road. Stuck in a hotel north of Milwaukee. Waiting out to snow. But soon we'll be together again. I could hardly wait till then. These lonely days are rough. Feeling blue, missing you. Soon ain't soon enough. She raised me upright, and life flew by in a blur. She was always there for me. Then I was there for her. Sitting right beside her and holding her hand, a band of angels come, took her to the promised land. And soon we'll be together again. I can hardly wait till then. These lonely days are rough. Feeling blue, missing you. Because soon, soon ain't soon. Soon, soon ain't soon enough. And that's uh, where I'm at with that thing. And I, I actually do have the music written. But uh, I don't want to play it for you right now. Just because uh, it might improve. I'm not saying it will, but it might improve immeasurably once I have it in my uh, workshop. You know, when I take it down into the into the garage, you know, it was Jack McGee went before he passed on. He used to live in my garage a lot, and uh, I would go down there and hang, we'd hang out together. And then when he passed on, I turned it into my home studio. But Jack McGee was the only pit bull on record ever that wore makeup. I don't know if you knew that. He wore eye makeup. His left eye, he would take one half of his left eye and make it pink, and the other half of his under, you know, that thing under the eye where they put the stuff on, one was pink, and the other half was white. And then this eye, he had black underneath it. And when he looked at you, you just look at his face and go, what the hell's wrong with his face? There's something in the body of ain't right. But it's the way he put on his makeup. And he was something. We were very close, Mr. McGee and I. Daddy! I take my teeth out. <laughs> uh, and I used to, <laughs> this is great, I used to tell my uh, nieces and nephews, they were young, uh, years back. And, and we had, you know, we had Jack the, the bulldog. He was a pit bull and he was a very exciting dog. And I used to tell the kids, I'd take him and we'd hang out with Jack and I would say, Hey guys, I said, you see a dog like this, they're different than other dogs. And I says, and when you talk to a dog like this, there's only one way to talk that he'll understand. I says, you have to use a certain tone of voice. And the kids were young, and they'd be, okay, Uncle Norm, what is it, what is it? And I go, I said, you have to talk like this to him. And I'd go, oh, Jackie. <laughs> Hello, Jack. So I had all the kids, <laughs> when they would talk to the dog, they'd always go, Hello, Jack. Wonderful to see you. <laughs> and I wonder now, now those kids are 35, <laughs> you know, grown up and kids of their own and thinking about Uncle Norm flushing that shit down the toilet, right? Oh, Jack. You have to talk to him like that. Hey, but we had fun with that shit. Uh, my buddy Bubs McKegg, that little half-breed, I say half-breed, half-mick, half-hunky. It's a good mix. He is threatened, and I was on public record as saying that he's going to record this song one day. And I say to him, you little sugar-lipped man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Bear said, man, didn't know it was the juice. Man said, bear, you went to jail when the truth came on. Game on. There's a life being lived. Something gotta give. Playing that lion's game. G said, Pete, you gotta come clean. You've been betting in a big red machine. Game on. Well, game on, yeah. There's a lie being lived, something gotta give, playing that lion's game. Tom said, Roger, I did not deflate. Roger said, Tom, I can't let you skate. Game on, well, game on. There's a lie being lived, something gotta give. Playing a liar's game. Jerry said, Joe, what I did to them kids wasn't right. Joe said, it's all about the blue and the white game on. Well, game on, game. There's a lie being lived, something gotta give game. Johnny, the glove don't fit. Johnny said, you're you, must have quit. Game on, well, game on. There's a lie being lived, something gotta give. Playing a lion's game. The Donald said, I'm gonna build us a wall. Said El Chapo, gonna pay for it all. Game on, we're Chapo. Game on, hey, hey, there's a lie being lived. Something gotta give, playing a lion's game. Bill said, Hill, I know part of that mess. Hill said, Bill, you left the proof on her dress. Game on. Game on, oh Billy. There's a light being lived, something gotta give game on. Get over here. Hey, um, McKeg threatened to cut that song one day. I think his wife Judy likes it. I think she likes that number, and she'd like to see it coming out of his sweet, sugar, half-breed lips. <laughs> and you know what? So would I. You know, McKeg, Moondog is uh, having, starting to get a man crush on McKeg. I'm starting to get jealous. Uh, McKeg just played a date for uh, Mooney at the Shrine. And uh, Moon calls me up about 2 o'clock in the morning. He's like, dude, he says, we just had McKeg uh, play at the Shrine. I says, yeah. And he says, dude, he's fantastic. He kicked ass. He got that voice. He plays great guitar. He's a star. And I was like, well, yeah, and has been. And uh, I'm glad Mooney stepped into it. And felt it, and he called me and told me and started bragging on McKay. And I was like, yeah, you're right. He really is, and always was. It made me feel good, and it also made me know. And then he said, he's up there. He said, he's an act. And it was like, 
yeah, it takes one to know one. And that's all. And that's a happy story. Because McKegg is the guy that let me hang out with the older cats and start as I started getting getting hair on my balls. He started letting me hang on the scene when I really didn't deserve. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And I was green as green can get. You know what I, I, I've been noticing lately? You know, whenever, when I was young and I started seeing like iridescent colors, like orange and green and all that stuff, I thought those colors were made up by people. And then I realized what they are is they actually are colors that exist in the world that people imitate and make those colors. But no color that you see ain't real somewhere. And how amazing is that? You know what I mean? Like, you know, there's the five basic colors, just like in music. There's the, you know, six, seven notes in a scale. And now it's all, we're all, we're all in the same deep water. We all get the same seven notes. What are you going to, what's in your shorts? What's in your meat wallet? What are you going to do with them seven notes? And for artists, they, there's a handful of colors and the same, they're all the same colors. They're all, and the shapes for an artist, shapes and colors, what the hell else they got? And what they find in those shapes and those colors, it either snaps a girdle or leaves a puddle. Think about it. Uh, I got a couple songs to play. And I'm not sure I have. There's anything else that I would like to talk about today. Mm -mm -mm -mm. You got half an hour. Oh, I have a half an hour to be with these nice people? Yes. Let's the voice of let's do a couple pieces of music uh, this is a song that uh, I guess I wrote it in the 90s and and when I was working on it I, I was I wanted to write uh, you know when, when you're um, you look back at music and, and, and you see that like they call, I think they call it secular music what we play like pop music and then there's the, you know, the um, gospel music, and I don't know what they call that, what the official word for it is, but like when Sam Cooke come around, he sang in gospel, and he took like the gospel music and the gospel feeling and wrote pop lyrics to it and became, uh, plus, one of the greatest singers of all time, and writers and handsome, and just a, really sad that he went early. Amazing person. and uh, But he took the gospel sounding music and put pop lyrics to it and um and and that thought hit my mind and i th and some of those songs i always just to be stupid to get people's attention i'd use the word bisexual <laughs> you know that song's bisexual because it could be sung in the church or it could be sung to your old lady in a romantic way and uh this and I, so so i had uh the idea that i wanted to try and write something that was bisexual. And I'd like to play it for you now. It's a little thing called I Was Blind Till I Saw You. And I think a lot of you guys have heard me do it live. I've done it over the years. I've done it with Whitey and uh, Lamont. Harry Bottoms uh, has banged out the bottom on this many a time. I was blind till I saw you. Secular, and I don't, I don't think they used the word gospel. But I'm not very intelligent. Sacred. Sacred? But is that the word they use? I've Maybe. heard that. Tom said sacred, and it's probably better than gospel. Uh, but this is one that goes both ways. <laughs> when I saw you, I saw the world come alive. Saw the sun come up and take the clouds from the sky when I saw you. Saw the flowers in the spring and all the colors autumn will bring. And I was blind till I saw you. Never knew the sky was blue and I never saw the sun shine through. I was blind till I saw you. When I saw you, I saw a river rolling by. 
I saw you Saw a mountain high when I saw you Saw a forest evergreen Saw a meadow blowing in the breeze And I was blind till I saw you I never knew the sky was blue And I never saw the sun shine through I was blind till I saw you I never saw a rainbow Never saw that part of gold But the first time I saw you Saw all those colors unfold When I saw you I saw an eagle soaring high I saw you Saw a butterfly When I saw you I saw a waterfall When I saw you I saw the writing on the wall And I was blind Till I saw you I never knew The sky was blue And I never saw the sun shine true I was blind Till I saw you. <laughs> I was blind till I saw you. I never knew the sky was blue. And I never saw the sun shine through. I was blind till I saw you. Kind of ran out of gas on that. You. I was blind till I saw you. I never knew the sky was blue. And I never saw the sun shine through. I was blind till I saw you And I was blind till I saw you I was blind till I saw you I was blind till I saw you I was blind till I saw you, baby! Kidding me? Hooting and hollering, trumpets blowing, squeeze box squeezing, chicks dancing, fainting, screaming out loud. Oh yeah, I like every goddamn thing about it. I was blind till I saw you. And then I bring in a little uh, Italian foreplay. I don't know if you girls that might be watching understand Italian foreplay but Italian foreplay it looks just here's exactly what it looks like from across the room get over here <laughs> you love that one Italian foreplay I was just talking stupid I can't remember who wrote this piece, uh, but everybody knows it, and I don't, every time I've done it, I always say, I should never even try and play shit like this, because what the hell, I'm a goof bag. You know what I mean? I'm a, what did I say last week? I'm a clown looking for a circus, and yet I sing something like this, who the hell, let me, ask, let me ask me a question. Who the hell do I think I am? Norman? You little guinea. Over the rainbow 
way up high There's a land that I heard of once In a lullaby Somewhere over the rainbow Skies of blue and the dream that you did to dream really do come true one day I wish upon a star and wake up where the clouds are far behind Troubled man like lamb and drops way up in the fingertops. That's where you find me somewhere over the rainbow. Blue birds fly, birds fly. Somewhere over the rainbow. Judy Garland, right? Are you kidding me? Come on, man. She was tight. Judy Garland was really something. Really something. My mother would speak of Judy Garland, and she'd get tears in her eyes because of the sadness of someone so talented and so beautiful and had such a great life, and... Uh, it didn't turn out as well as it might have at the end there. And uh, my mother felt that pain because she understood the greatness that was inside that woman. She also understood the greatness inside Francis, Albert, Sinatra, that nickel rocket pimp, that stone jag. He still owes skinny and bought a $500. Little prick. Blue-eyed Italian, you kidding me? That shit ain't fair. How do you compete with that as a man? Well, you don't. You take scraps. How you do? Because I'll come right over there. Francis Albert. Go ahead. Everybody watching, help do what my mother would do with me. Let's all together make the sign of the cross. Francis Albert. That's Wop Dot. I had another guitar song I wanted to play, but I don't know if I will. How much do we have time for another song? Minutes. Oh, we got time for it. You got time for as long as it's not in a God of the Vita. You know, I played a show. <laughs> you brought that up. I played a show with uh, those guys. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you hadn't have said that, Tom. Um, and I play. I I think the name of the club was Jacob's Ladder. And it was in Greensburg. And I think it was right around 1974. I'm thinking. And we opened a show for them. They had this guy, Doug. I think he was the keyboard player. And he was the Vita man. He was in the God of the Vita. Uh, I was never much for all the psychedelic songs and all that. That was a little... That wasn't into that song. But, you know, 
There's a lot of shit that most people like that I don't like. In fact, I want to do a show about it one day. Tom, remind me, we'll do a show about it. all the acts that I don't, that I can't stand. Sticks. Nugent. I'm not a Rush fan. And I know a lot of people are going to, are throwing shit at their camp, at their TVs and their computers right now for me saying I'm not a Rush fan. But I ain't. Boston. Ain't me. The cars. It ain't me. You know, um, We'll do a show about all the bands I can't stand. But no, maybe we shouldn't. Who in the hell that cares? That would be a long show. That would be a long show, Tom says. Right, right. You got that right. Hey, uh, wrote this back in the, back around 1989, 1990. Brought it back a couple years ago. Started doing it again. I'm a hope. I hope I don't screw it up too bad. And on top of that, I'm a hope. She will gonna like. I don't say the things I wish I would say. Don't have the wings to carry you away. I don't make that much, and I'm not big and strong. With the times I'm out of touch, about most things I'm wrong. But you know my heart, it's tried and true. I'll always be the man who loves you. I know I've tried to be like I should. I got this wild side. I'd change if I could. I've chased down my dreams. And gone up in flames Then the smoke cleared And you remain Deep in my heart There's a song that rings true I'll always be The man who loves you Gonna be chiseled in stone your name and mine strong enough to stand the test of time this love in my heart like an ember it glows like a fire it burns like a river it flows so deep and so wide honest and true so proud to be the man who loves you I'll always be the man who loves you mm -hmm. well
the man who loves you. You know, on stage, when I do that, I always do a comedy routine, and I would always say, uh, like the beginning of the song, da -da 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 -dum 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 -dum. writing that, it was like writing like what they say when a queen comes in the room, they have like some guys with real tight pants on, and then have their stones like tucked in between their legs, pulled back so they wouldn't be bulging around and scaring the children. And then these guys would ha play these horns with a real long, and they'd be go, and that's the sound of that music that uh, I wrote for the song. But on the gigs, I would say, yeah, I'm, when I wrote it, I, I was I didn't think uh, money was going to be no problem, so I could afford to have a quartet of uh, four French whores, I mean horns, play that part. It's a good routine, right? The French horns, French whores. And then I always say, but I couldn't afford the French horns. And and you know what? The way it worked out, I couldn't afford the four French whores either. So what are you going to do? You do what you can with what you got. Uh, man, thank you for watching 12 here today. We are uh, we're going to keep going for a while. We have more shit to talk about, more songs to play. I got to next time we get together I'm hoping to play this new song soon and I didn't play play uh, any of uh, the music for it but like real quick I'll, I'll give you just a before we uh, shut your ass down here I'll give you a little bit of what what the music was what the music's gonna be <laughs> so you can have it to look forward to and you can this way you can watch the song grow and develop as it's being written uh Like that's the way it's written. It's kind of dramatic, you know what I mean? So, so, so it would start off like this. Kind of like that stuff. It's gonna be like. I was awake and educated, but talking on the phone, and I could hear the hurt in her voice. Said, "Boy, when you coming home?" And then the chorus would be, "Soon." We'll be together again, and I can hardly wait till then. These lonely days are rough. Feeling blue, missing you, cause soon, soon ain't soon enough. Get some French words to play on that, too, right? But anyway, that's the, the little um, insight as to what the song is about. And hoping you can be looking forward to that song growing into a wonderful blooming flower. Well, my parents were kids in a home with a Brushton on the east side here. Every summer, they would have a contest with the Post Gazette. I forget was the press or the Post Gazette. And what they, all the dagos would grow sunflowers. And then they would take pictures of them. And then uh, the Post Gazette would come out and take pictures and measure them to see who had the biggest and most beautiful sunflowers. And then they would have awards that the newspaper would give every year for the biggest and the best sunflowers. And all the, you know, ain't nobody won but Italians, right? Are you kidding me? In a home with a brush, them. Love every goddamn thing about the, our Italian people. And uh, this year, we had we had some sunflowers. We got them in late, and um, but they were like miniature sunflowers, and so so like the kind that you see a field of sunflowers, and they can grow about this high or this high, and just in their own way, there when there's a mess of them, it's almost as impressive as them big sunflowers like this big, that their heads drooped on, and you have to get one of them neck braces whenever you're in a car wreck for it. And you put that on your sunflower and then it head sticks up. Do you ever smoke sunflower seeds? Me neither. <laughs> okay, maybe I did. Maybe I tried it. We will be, we will be back in two weeks. I'm going to try to have uh, my new song soon. I don't know what other pieces of music I'm going to do. But I'm going to keep uh, bringing them to you. And I got some new ideas for some great shit to talk about. And we're also probably going to talk about 1981. 
next time we get together, which is an amazing year. We were all in different cities every day and playing with all these crazy different acts. With the Tigers, we was all young and pretty, walking into the room like it's here. How do you go? We're here. The Tigers, baby. When I was young and we would be on the road and I'd start talking backstage, coming in, just meeting people. As soon as I start talking and I'd say Pittsburgh, everybody would turn around and look. And they'd be like, who's this MF who think he's coming in here from Pittsburgh? He thinks he's a badass. I could see on their faces the respect they had. And I hadn't played a goddamn note yet. I hadn't even kicked their ass yet. And they were respecting because I was from Pittsburgh and I was talking loud and saying nothing. They could tell I was a street carny, you know what I mean? They, could, they, they looked at me and they go, look at, this, look at this son of a bitch. He could talk his way in or out of any situation because he got the gift. God touched his tongue! Gave him the gift of gabagoo. Thank you guys for hanging with us. It's, Nor it's the Norman Stein guitar. Oh, I just broke the stand. Ain't that just like a, ain't that just like a Norman? Tom's taking a picture of this culturally Art Deco-ish 1960s wonderful piece of Pittsburgh art that defines my father and everything he stood for. It really oh. warms up the place. Doesn't it, Tom? With the Steeler Country sign over there. The Steeler it. Country sign, Tom, comes from my parents' apartment. Yes. So when they were both gone, I took that and I said, that's with me the rest of my goddamn life. The eaten Alive uh, big thing came from my friend Louie. He got it out of a one of the National Record Mart stores in 1981 or 82, and he had it in his mother's garage, and he just turned me on to it like a year or two ago. And whenever I saw it, I said, you know, we're going to bring that back. That is so, once again, classic from years gone by. Just like this piece here. How about my poem from Rachel, The King? Hey, guys, thank you so much for hanging with us. I'm going to play us out of here. Play a song I've been playing on the past few times we've gotten together. And it's a swinging little sister. <laughs> swing music. Has anybody out there, like me, been listening back to old swing music lately? I've been listening to Frank Sinatra records lately. And a lot of them are the classic ones that you know. You know the Summer Wind. How whopped out is that shit? And, it, it, and that song there becomes even greater when you know the movie... The Pope of Greenwich Village, which to me was one of the greatest pictures ever filmed. Mickey Rourke and uh, Eric Roberts. The best movie Eric Roberts ever sniffed in his goddamn life. Not that he isn't a really good actor, but that was him at his, he played Polly, this amazing Dago character that was just, everybody had one in their family just like him. And his cousin Mick, who was a half breed, he was half Irish and half Italian. But he was pretty as they came, baby. He, was, he wasn't a waiter, he was a maitre d. You see what I'm saying? Big difference. How you doing? Joints jumping, pimps and hoes. But there's something missing till you show. Been in a party till you get here. When you ride. Everybody get turned up The joint come alive You make my blue disappear And ain't a party till you get here People swear And ain't a party till you get here When you arrive Everybody get